Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we would be discussing about tuberculosis, a communicable disease, the incidence of which has acquired serious proportions, being one of the top 10 causes of deaths worldwide and becoming a global epidemic. The year 2018 alone saw 1.5 million TB-related deaths. In the same year, 10 million people fell sick with TB and nearly half a million developed drug-resistant TB. Uh, to discuss this further, we have today with us two guests, Lena from Medicines of Frontier uh, and Gina, who is with the Delhi Network of Positive People. Uh, both of our guests have been closely following the issue and have been at the forefront of dealing uh, with various issues pertaining to TB, be it the policy framework or access on the ground. So welcome, Lena and Gina. Uh, so Lena, if you could uh, please start with uh, taking us through the enormity of the challenge uh, that uh, we face at the hands of TB globally, uh, and especially the rise of uh, drug-resistant TB. Yeah, you know, when uh, we had first-line TB treatment, the combination of four drugs in the 90s, mm -hmm. the World Health Organizations and governments like India thought that, you know, they've just overcome TB. And there was a complacency in among governments and the WHO mm -hmm. that uh, we are just going to be able to treat everyone with those drugs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the bacteria has been there for millions of years. It evolved and developed resistance to the drugs we were using. And today, it's one of the biggest public health emergencies that we have globally, particularly in India. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, if I can get Gina into it, uh, uh, I mean, what are the issues uh, that you face at the, uh, at the ground level when you are there providing services to the people? Uh, some of the issue, I, what I can cite it here is that uh, recently, uh, See, uh, I'll just compare between some of the things we faced before and some of the things we face now. Before two years back, like there was no proper diagnosis of like MDR. There was no like uh, everyone with HIV is not compulsory. I'm just linking my like things with the people living with HIV. Uh, CVNet was not there at that time, but now the CVNet is there. Uh, every PLHIB who are symptomatic is like uh, written by the doctors for uh, CBNET. But the thing is that the challenges we face here is that the basic thing we need to get tested uh, um, uh, to collect the sample, the falcum tube, mm. like is uh, like in and out, uh, like uh, stock out from the stairs clinic. Uh, this is one of the issue that we come across last two, three months back. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the issue we come across is the side effect management, uh, special, uh, for both like first line TV or for MDR, there is no proper side, uh, side effect management. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 side, and there is no proper counseling in the system TV system. Right. This is the some of the challenges we face. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, if I can get Lena into it, uh, perhaps I should have asked this first. So, WHO had called for a move from injectables to uh, oral therapy. Yeah. I mean, why was that and what were the uh, problems? What people didn't realize was that when drug resistance came about, there were no new drugs. So, people started to scramble around and use the older antibiotics that had been actually abandoned mm -hmm. as too toxic. Mm -hmm. So, majority of the drugs that we're using for drug-resistant tuberculosis are drugs that actually doctors did not want to use. Mm -hmm. So, you had older antibiotics like PAS, cyclosirine, um, many of these drugs being brought back and used for DRTB. And extremely toxic, they cause a lot of side effects. And particularly the injectables, the class of injectables, mm -hmm. uh, for example, streptomycin and the other uh, injectables, ha also cause hearing loss. So, you know, you had a lot of people living with HIV who had psychosis, depression, extreme mm -hmm. nausea, mm -hmm. but low, they had lifelong disabilities. Mm -hmm. So, they lost the hearing mm -hmm. or partially lost the hearing. And in many ways, the life was completely changed by DRTB. And maybe uh, the HIV uh, positive people who are more vulnerable and more at risk, I think they face much more problems. Yeah. In uh, the, one of the cases we closely follow is uh, about one of our colleagues. Mm -hmm. Last two years uh, back, when we come to know about her, like 
we really closely follow up all the process. Uh, even diagnostic takes too much long time. Uh, too much long time uh, before she was diagnosed with typhoid. After that, after one month of eating medicine, uh, like uh, she suspect about TB. After that, she was returned for CBNet, and it take a lot of process even to diagnose. And when she started medicine. Uh, she just bear that six months of injecting drugs, but after that slowly she lost her strength and she started uh, like suffering from all the side in, uh, side effects like nausea. This she even lost her hear hearing, and uh, one day she hear me. Uh, I just want to run away from here. I just want don't want to live now. This is the condition of this certain medicine. Like huge side effect. Mm -hmm. This is a certain medicine which, like now, is going on. So this should be phased out because we have seen closely the tremendous like side effect that bear by the people living with HIV from this uh, current medicine of the drug resistance. Mm -hmm. So there have been some improvements in the drugs and some new effective drugs like uh, bedaquiline and delaminid have come about. Yeah. Uh, uh, so how effective they are and. See, uh, I think what is very important to understand that we were dealing with a public health emergency. We had older toxic drugs which are being used, prolonged use, without any clinical trials and safety trials. Mm -hmm. And then you had two new drugs, Bedaculin and Deliminate, who went through phase 2B trials. Mm -hmm. So the decision had to be made by governments and WHO, would we allow the use of these two new drugs? Okay without full phase 3 data coming in. And a decision was made, whether rightly or wrongly, that these two new drugs would be provided uh, to people living uh, with DRTB. Mm -hmm. What is very interesting is that South Africa started to collect data very systematically. Mm -hmm. And they realized that mortality was down, efficacy was up to 70%. Now, if you compare efficacy, of the older regimens, it was less than 50% for MDR, and for the extremely drug resistance, it was less than 30%. And then you had efficacy of, of you know, adding bedaculin to regimens through 70%. So South Africa actually changed the whole system by saying bedaculin should be available to all people living with DRTB. Mm -hmm. And that's when actually government started to move and WHO mm -hmm. started to move, saying we can remove injectables. South Africa has done it. Mm -hmm. And we can put bedaculin as a core drug mm -hmm. in the regimen of DRTB. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially how it all happened. Okay. You know. uh, but we see that there are still problems in access to these medicines, I mean, uh, maybe prices. And so if you could tell us about this entire thing. Yeah, so there are three top uh, uh, mm -hmm. access barriers for people who mm -hmm. have drug resistant tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. For children, mm -hmm. the safety data is coming in quite late. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the newer drugs, Deliminate, which is approved for children uh, age three and above, mm -hmm. is very rarely available in the country. Mm -hmm. That is one of the reason is because the pharmaceutical company Otsuka was late in providing data. Even today, they haven't provided data from three to six years to the Indian FDA. Mm -hmm. But it's also partially the government's own reticence mm -hmm. uh, to allow generic manufacturer of these drugs. So we have highly dependent mm -hmm. for bedaculin and Deliminate on the two big pharma companies. One is a US mm -hmm. pharma company and one is a Japanese pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. So they are holding us hostage mm -hmm. on the supply of these drugs. Yeah. So what do you think that can be done, I mean, uh, uh, the, the first thing that can be done easily if uh, the access to these medicines needs to be increased, as Gina has mentioned that uh, there are a lot of problems in terms of uh, access to these me medicines on the ground? I think uh, two uh, issues are very, very fundamental. I think community monitoring of DRTB, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, where actually, for example, organizations like Delhi Network of Positive People mm -hmm. ensure that all people living with HIV mm -hmm. who have DRTB have bedaculin as part of the regimen. Mm -hmm. I think that's not happening. So mm -hmm. even though the WHO said all people with DRTB mm -hmm. should have bedaculin as part of the regimen, it's not happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I think community monitoring mm -hmm 
of the DRTB program is essential. Mm -hmm. And number two is this that, you know, uh, JNJ and Otsuka's donations will go only so far. Mm -hmm. At some level, India plays a role in global health mm -hmm. and the alternative suppliers have the raw materials. Mm -hmm. Why not bring them to fight this uh, global health emergency? Absolutely. And so I was also wondering that largely uh, the uh, treatment is dependent upon donations and uh, even the government uh, doesn't do much more than receiving donations and so how uh, is that, is that sustainable at all in the coming, I mean that we have to, uh, the target of uh, removing TB by 2025 in India for that matter. Yeah. So I mean uh, is it sustainable at all? No, at donation all? is not sustainable and mm -hmm. all we like government have to look some long lasting sustainable things like uh, to provide the medicine to the mm -hmm. people. Donation will, of course donation can be cut at every, any time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, uh, at the beginning of the AIDS response, mm -hmm. we saw some uh, donations and charity from mm -hmm. Pfizer and GSK. Mm -hmm. And you could only treat a handful of, of patients. Mm -hmm. And that's why actually, you know, as treatment activists, we've been saying mm -hmm. that, you know, the first phase of rollout has been dependent on donations. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, now you're tendering for these drugs. Now a tender system is dependent on multiple suppliers. Mm -hmm. If you just have a single source, mm -hmm. then you're going to pay the price the company demands of you. Mm -hmm. So I think the tendering system fails when it comes to monopolies and single source suppliers, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem that to today we have, mm -hmm. is the government has been trying to negotiate lower prices, mm -hmm. but has been finding it very difficult because, you know, obviously they know that there's no competition. So, you know, they will not lower the prices beyond what they have already decided globally. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I was also wondering, I mean, there was this recently concluded uh, executive board meeting, 146th executive board meeting at the WHO. And so, they presented one progress report and the other was a draft global strategy on TB. Yeah. Uh, but do you think it actually addresses the issues that are there and, uh, I mean, because uh, the issue of TRIPS flexibilities and all use of those TRIPS flexibilities has hardly been perhaps uh, pointed out in these documents. You know, you rightly pointed out something, you know, strategies are laid out at the global level and governments then tend yeah. to implement them. Mm -hmm. What happens with the global strategy is, mm -hmm. ironically, it says that we need to protect IP. Now, the intellectual property system mm -hmm. for the last 50 years has failed to deliver for tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Why will we increase intellectual property protection? Mm -hmm. It hasn't given us the antibiotics we need, let alone for TB, for many other infections. Yeah. So I think this is where I think globally the strategy fails on that count. Mm -hmm. I think we have to recognize that the intellectual property system has its serious limitations today. Mm -hmm. It is not being able to address antibiotic resistance mm -hmm. in TB and many other areas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we keep going back to the older intellectual property system and hope that somehow innovations will come mm -hmm. and then you know somehow we'll manage to lower prices by negotiations mm -hmm. it's just too late for patients mm -hmm. i think uh, we have to have a collaborative model of r d and the collaborative model of r d also means that actually public funded research and institutions contribute to that process mm -hmm. and have a uh, ownership and responsibility to ensure that the end product is available to patients yeah True. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, in India, for instance, I mean, we are approaching uh, the World's TB Day, 24th March. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we see that recently one of the parliamentarians has also written in terms of access to TB drugs that yes. it should be made available in India. And it's still not on the national list of essential medicines, uh, the uh, TB medicines. So in, in that scenario, I mean, what would you like to send a message to the government that uh, this should be done immediately and as a long-term strategy also. Maybe we can take Gina in. Uh, to like uh, this, uh, as a long-term strategy, like uh, those old, uh, that, like falcom tubes stock out, medicine stock out, means like uh, should not be there. One of the things, if like we really want to eliminate the uh, TB by 2025, this shortage should not be there. And uh, the systems, everything, this side effect management, even the, the counseling system which is lacking in the system uh, should like uh, put in the guide, um, uh, guideline and should be implemented properly. Um, this is the thing. Yeah. 
and in fact, you know, just highlighting uh, why Gina is raising the point. Today, we want to roll out injection-free regimens. Mm -hmm. For children, you can't do that without Delaminade. And mm -hmm. today, we have a countrywide shortage of Delaminade mm -hmm. because months were spent negotiating with Utsuka and Myelin to provide the drug at an affordable cost. So, I think this is the time actually, and I would say this um, particularly as I've seen many, you know, women uh, and very young women actually have DRTB. And I realize that, you know, our lives are so badly compromised forever because we have hearing loss. We can't go to work. Uh, we are, uh, we are uh, asked to leave our families, you know, uh, marital homes. Mm -hmm. We lose custody of our children. This is happening to women with DRTB on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And if we could provide a safer and more effective treatment, mm -hmm. we could address some of these issues that women face. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point of time, I think the next step is towards making sure that these are produced by and manufactured in the country mm -hmm. and available to the TB program. Mm -hmm. True. I guess, I mean, there are lots of issues which are unaddressed and as you rightly pointed out, the first thing is that we start producing them and uh, through generic I mean, yeah. uh, ways and uh, uh, hope that uh, some concrete steps would be taken by the government soon. Uh, thank you for being with us and uh, watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.